starting to begin, so I'll just wait. Yeah. Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at Christ's ascension. And, uh, uh, you know, when he went back to the Father, what was uh, the position he received? Uh, what was the glory he received back? Um, and what were the privileges? So we see that because he finished the task, he was given back his position, his glory, his honor of him. God, uh, of him receiving back the glory that belongs to God alone. And we also see that um, his name is declared as the greatest name under heaven and earth, and all authority and power uh, in heaven and on earth has been made subject to Christ um, Jesus. Okay. And so we saw that uh, Jesus received back the glory that he had. Uh, or the position that he had before his incarnation. Uh, and uh, we know that he was and is and will always be the eternal word. Um, the last point in your notes is the preaching of his uh, resurrection. We see that um, uh, we looked at various uh, references, Acts chapter 2 and other references as well, where uh, uh, the other apostles, the other writers of uh, uh, the uh, New Testament, we see them, uh, you know, talking or writing about uh, Christ's resurrection uh, and talking about the importance of Christ's resurrection, what does it does to our faith and what are the benefits that we receive. And um, Paul talks a great deal about it. So we see that the early church boldly preached uh, that Christ was risen and exalted, even though they were asked by the chief priest leaders uh, not to do so, uh, but they continued um, talking and preaching about the resurrected Christ, the resurrected savior. And um, this is something that we need to do as well. This is a gospel that we need to preach. Uh, this is the truth that we need to exalt. We need to preach um, that Christ is resurrected and he is exalted compared to every other God man who's come here on the earth. Uh, you know, Christ is the uh, first. Uh, you know, man, we'll read about it in First Corinthians, uh, who is resurrected from the dead. It's gone back to the Father because he is God himself, okay, uh, compared to the other God men that the other God men that we have here on earth who have lived. Uh, but like Paul says, you know, like David, his grave is still here. We have all of their graves, uh, but we see that Jesus is no God man. He is not a uh, 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 intermediary being between uh, God and man who came to reconcile the world to God, but he is God himself. And uh, he came down to this earth. He was fully God. He was fully man. Uh, he gave up, uh, willingly chose to give up his certain privileges that makes him uh, God or his deity. He gave it up uh, so that he can taste the fullness of humanity. He can uh, identify us uh, with us in our weaknesses, in our frailties, fully identify with us and make the full sufficient perfect sacrifice because only a sinless man uh, can make uh, the sinless perfect um, sacrifice that will appease uh, the wrath of God, uh, will uh, pay the full penalty for sins once for all. And we see Jesus doing that. And um, Hence, we have this gospel that we too need to preach. We need to share about uh, uh, to others, uh, which is talking about the truth of his resurrection and his exaltation. Okay, And your notes uh, in, in this chapter ends with that you will learn about the proof of his resurrection uh, when you do the co course on Christian apologetics. Okay, uh, But I'd just like to throw some light, give you some insights on a few things. Um, uh, maybe we can have a good discussion. Uh, the nature of Christ's resurrection. Uh, 
so we see that Christ, uh, this is not in your notes, so if you just want to uh, take your own notes, you're welcome to. Christ's resurrection uh, is not something that he simply came back from the dead uh, like others had experienced when he raised uh, Lazarus back uh, from, uh, from the dead or when he raised the, uh, the widow of Nain, uh, her son, back uh, uh, to life, uh, Jairus's daughter. So it was not just Christ coming um, uh, back from the dead, like Lazarus that we read in John chapter 11, verses 1 to 44. Uh, uh, so when we say that Jesus came back um, from the dead, uh, like Lazarus has experienced, or Jairus' daughter had experienced, or the, the the son of the widow of Nain had experienced, and we're saying that uh, uh, Jesus would have been subject to, again, back to weakness and aging, and eventually would have died again, just like uh, Lazarus died one day, eventually Jairus' daughter died one day, uh, and he would have ju just died like any other human being. But when we say that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, you know, Paul mentions Jesus as the first fruits of those who came back from death to life. We read this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 20 and 23. So can one of you read that, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 and 23. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse uh, 20 and 23. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 and 23. 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who has fallen asleep. 23. But each in his own turn, Christ he made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ, the first fruit, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Thank you. Uh, it will be good to read even verses uh, 20 and 21, uh, sorry, 21 and 22. Siddhi Kenu, can you please read that as well? Yes, ma'am. 21. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. 22. For as in Adam all dies, so in Christ all will be made alive. Thank you. So here we see that uh, uh, Christ, uh, when he rose from the dead, he became the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That means all those who died before Christ, he's the first one to have uh, been risen from the dead. And, you know, since he's the first fruit, there are more fruits to follow. And that is talking about all of us uh, believers uh, who would die in Christ uh, uh, after we receive salvation. We will also have this assurance that we will rise again and that we will live eternally just as Christ lives eternally. Okay. And verse 21 says, death came through one man, that is Adam. And the resurrection also comes through another man, and that is uh, Jesus. And Jesus is referred to uh, in Paul, in his theology, as the last Adam. And uh, the, the first Adam that God created, uh, you know, Adam, he's referred to as the first Adam. Okay, so in the first Adam, all die, but in uh, the last Adam, who is referred to as Jesus Christ, all will be made um, alive, it says, but in each one his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So when we, when Christ comes, all those who are dead in Christ will rise again and will be taken up and we will live with him uh, eternally. Okay, and uh, Christ being the first fruit of resurrection, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, a, uh, is somebody who goes ahead of us uh, and who, you know, shows us that there is life um, and the life that uh, Christ received that, you know, when he received, he received a glorified body, uh, which is no, or he received a spiritual body or a glorified body that each one of us will receive um, when we rise again. Uh, we will no longer be subject to weaknesses, frailties, aging, uh, to death, but we will live um, eternally. Like Paul writes in the same chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, verses uh, 53, he says, you know, uh, we put on, uh, that will put on immortality. So can one of you read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
verse 53 and before that you can read verses uh, uh, 42 to 44 where it talks about um, where Paul is talking about the resurrection bod resurrected body which will be raised imperishable in glory in power uh, and all of us will receive a spiritual body. So that he mentions, uh, he writes about in First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 44. So if you can read 42 to 44 and verse 53 will be good. So can one of you read that, please? First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42. So will it be with the resurrection of dead? The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also spiritual body. Verses 52. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and will be charged. Thank you. So here, um, uh, Paul is very beautifully talking about uh, uh, the resurrected body. And he says that uh, the resurrected body that is, um, that is sown is, uh, you know, perishable. Uh, uh, it's talking about our natural body will be raised, uh, will be raised imperishable. That is talking about our spiritual bodies. If you look at uh, verses 46, verse 48, he says, um, you know, or uh, if you look at verse 46, it says, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was out of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those of the earth. And as uh, is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Uh, and just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. So even as we live in natural bodies, we bear uh, the likeness of the natural man, that is Adam. Uh, sin reigns in us, sin reigns in our mortal body. We are given into the, uh, the law of sin. Uh, uh, we are, uh, you know, slaves of Satan. But when, uh, when um, we receive Christ, you know, we... Uh, come like uh, the spiritual man that is from heaven and we are born again in our spirit man uh, and also when we die we will receive our spiritual bodies and we will no longer uh, you know uh, have to die an eternal death so he's saying here that you know those of us who uh, are dead to sin uh, and he talks about the baptism that you know uh, immersed in water that is uh, dead to sin dead in Christ, we will be raised up, uh, we will have the life of Christ, and we have this hope, we have this, uh, this assurance that we would um, receive uh, the crown of life, we will receive our glorified spiritual bodies, uh, we'll reign together with Christ, we will reign with him uh, eternally. And all of this is because of uh, uh, Christ's finished work on the cross and because of which he was resurrected back from dead to life. He's the first fruit and we are uh, those to follow in uh, what Christ has experienced. We too will be raised from the dead we will receive our spiritual glorified bodies um, our bodies that are um, corruptible will will be non-corruptible bodies that are perishable will be become imperishable our bodies that are uh, mortal will become immortal immortal and there will be no longer any uh, weaknesses aging or death when we will be able to live eternally with um, Christ and so Paul says that uh, the resurrected bodies is raised imperishable in glory in power and we will have spiritual bodies okay so that's a great assurance uh, that we have and this is because of um, uh, Christ's completed work and his resurrection from the dead. So we look at, uh, that was the nature of Christ's resurrection. We look at doctrinal significance of uh, the resurrection. Uh, Christ's resurrection uh, ensures our regeneration. What do we mean by regeneration?
regeneration what does it mean new life okay uh, born again uh, receiving new life uh, a newness to the old nature that is there so peter says that we have been born anew uh, in in first peter chapter 1 verse 3 peter says that we have been born anew to a living through the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead okay so in his resurrection uh, jesus earned for us a new life uh, just like his uh, we do not receive all of this new life or this resurrected life when we become christians because our body still remains the same. We still are in our natural bodies. Um, we are still subject to weaknesses, aging, and death. But in our spirits, we are made new. We are born again. We have the life um, of God. We uh, are made alive with the new resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And so we see that it's through his resurrection that Christ earned for us this new kind of life uh, uh, when we can experience the eternal life here and now. Uh, we do not receive all of that new life, but, uh, you know, because we are in living in our same old bodies. Um, but when we are born again, yes, we do receive uh, and can taste the eternal life. Even though we go through struggles, we have the hope, we have the joy, we have assurance, we have the, the strength God gives us, uh, he equips us, and we have the enabling power of the Holy Spirit who enables us, undergirds us, and helps us to do and fulfill God's purposes here on um, earth. Okay, so... It is through Christ's resurrection that uh, it is he earned for us this new kind of life that we receive when we are born again. Uh, and that is why Paul can say uh, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, and even in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, says, God has made us alive together with Christ. It says, by grace you have been saved. And it also says in these uh, verses that he has raised us up with him. So can one of you please read Ephesians chapter 2 verses 5 and 6 please? Ephesians chapter 2 verses 5 and 6. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 5 and 6. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in, trans in transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. Thank you. So it says God has raised us up with Christ and has seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ uh, Jesus. Okay. So, uh, you know, we've been made alive in Christ. We're together with Christ. And it is by grace that we have been saved. And it also says that we have been raised up uh, with him and uh, we're seated where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So when God raised Christ from the dead, uh, he thought of us as somehow being raised with Christ. And therefore, uh, you know, when he looks at each one of us, he sees us as people who are born again, but deserve, deserving the merits of Christ's resurrection. And that is why uh, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he says his goal in his life is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Because Paul knew that there's so much of uh, power in Christ's resurrection, the position that it's earned him, uh, the, uh, the grace that has uh, been bestowed upon him, the favor that has been bestowed upon him, uh, the benefits that uh, has been bestowed upon him. Siddhi uh, Kenu, can you kindly uh, mute your mic? Thank you. Okay. So... Uh, and he says that, you know, he wants to know more of that resurrection power. So Paul uh, knew that even in his life, the resurrection power of Christ gave him uh, the new power for Christian ministry and his obedience to God. So uh, the power, resurrection power of Christ not only uh, gives us um, uh, the God kind of life uh, or the nature of God in our spirit man uh, when we are born again, 
uh, it not only uh, makes us alive together in Christ um, uh, he, when we taste uh, eternal uh, eternal uh, uh, life in the future, but also we can taste it and experience now. We're also raised up, we're seated with Christ in heavenly realms. But he says that, you know, the resurrection power of Christ Jesus uh, gives him the power that he needs to do his Christian ministry and also to live in obedience to God. So Paul connects the resurrection of Christ with the spiritual power at work within us when he tells the, the church at Ephesus uh, that he's praying that they would know uh, and he writes about this in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 to 20 he says uh, it's his prayer for the church at Ephesus that they would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe according to the work of his great might which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him sit at the right hand in heavenly places so uh, you know uh, Paul has just been overwhelmed and just uh, been excited uh, just experience experiencing the the resurrection power of Christ in various aspects of his life and he's uh, praying the same that uh, for the church at Ephesus that uh, the church at Ephesus would uh, their eyes would be open they would know uh, the immeasurable greatness of this power uh, that is in each one of us who believe uh, according to the working of his great might which he accomplished in Christ when he raised uh, Christ from the dead and made him sit at the right hand in the heavenly places. So here Paul says that uh, the power by which God raised Christ from the dead is the same power at work within us and Paul further uh, you know, sees us as raised in Christ when he says uh, in Romans chapter 6 verses 4 and verse 11. Can one of you read that please? Romans chapter 6 verse 4 and verse 11. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 and 11. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. So when we partake in uh, or when we take baptism, it's not just an outward sign of our inward uh, you know, uh, renewal or uh, confessing that we have uh, accepted Christ Jesus and making it known to other believers so that, um, you know, they have the, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the authority or they have the freedom uh, to uh, check us or correct us when we, uh, you know, fall away or when we go um, astray from God's uh, ways or paths or live in sin or in disobedience, having known that we have uh, accepted Jesus Christ as our personal savior but he gives a new uh, meaning or an understanding to the whole aspect of water baptism and he says that um, you know um, when we are immersed into water uh, you know it is as if we are buried with Christ uh, in his death that means we are dead to uh, sins the power of sin has no longer um, uh, control of our, over our body the dominion or the reign of sin has no longer power and authority in our bodies um, we are no longer uh, uh, you know slaves uh, of Satan and under his power and authority but we are dead to sin and uh, you know, when we come out of the water, it's like, you know, we have been resurrected um, with newness of life that uh, we receive um, because of Christ's resurrection, him being the first fruit of those who were resurrected from the dead. We receive the resurrected life. We receive the new life. Um, the eternal life. We receive the blessings. Um, we receive the glory 
uh, that the Father had bestowed uh, upon us when he created Adam and Eve in his likeness, in his image, in his perfection, um, when he created uh, Adam and Eve uh, in the Garden of Eden. And, um, uh, you know, we too can acknowledge that and we are raised up just like Christ. We're seated in our heaven, the heaven places. So it um, shows us uh, a position, authority that we have, who we are in Christ, uh, what are the privileges that we have uh, so that we can walk in the newness of life, that we don't walk in our old sinful carnal nature, old ways of life, old ways of doing things when we were under the law of sin, the reign of sin, but we walk in newness of life. Um, and he goes on to say that you must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This new resurrection power um, in a, um, you know, uh, includes power also to gain more and more victory over uh, the sin that is there in our mortal bodies, our physical bodies, and in our soul, that is our mind, will, in our emotions. Okay, uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, uh, he says, sin will have no dominion over you because you are not under the law but under Christ or you are under grace now so um, as we are under Christ or we are born again uh, you know sin has no dominion over us and that is because of the new resurrection power that is in us which includes uh, the power um, to gain more and more victory over uh, the sins that are remaining sins that are in our uh, bodies, in our uh, in our souls, a tendency to sin because we have the same old uh, uh, flesh, the same old soul. Um, but uh, you know, we have this promise that we don't uh, that that sin cannot reign in our bodies we have the dominion over that uh, we can gain more and more victory over the remaining sin and um, be transformed into Christ's likeness uh, even as we will be made perfect in this life so the resurrection power uh, also includes power for ministry uh, the work in God's kingdom and also uh, uh, helps us to be uh, uh, to be to be sanctified to be more Christ-like, so that we will be made uh, blameless without spot or blemish and be presented before the Most God. Okay, um, so we see that it is after Christ's resurrection that he promised his disciples, um, uh, you know, um, to go and wait in um, Jerusalem. But we see. Uh, Soon after, uh, you know, Jesus rose from the dead, when he came to the disciples, uh, it says in Luke, I think it's Luke chapter 24 or 22, uh, his, uh, it says that Jesus breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. But we see other references, and one of them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, just before he ascended back to the Father, he says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, or the ends of the earth. Now, so you can say when... Jesus already, uh, when we read in Luke chapter 22, I think it's Luke chapter uh, 22 or it's uh, 24. Um, I think it's uh, Luke, in, in Luke chapter 24, of course, he says in um, verse... Um, in verse 48, it says, you are my witnesses of these things. Uh, in verse 49, I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. Uh, or, okay, don't know, I think be drawn and not. Okay, so in one of those uh, verses, he's, uh, Jesus says, you know, um, and he breathed on them, and uh, he says, receive the Holy Spirit, and, um, you know, that was their born again uh, experience. I'm not able to find that. 
was okay i'll um i will uh share that with you but um, you know jesus did that after he died and he rose again and it's basically so we have two you know uh, verses here where jesus prayed on them and they received the holy spirit and uh, we also read in uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 49, he says, you know, wait uh, in Jerusalem till you've been clothed with power from an eye. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he also tells them that. Um, so what are these two things? Okay, uh, so what we read uh, when when Jesus prayed on them is basically, uh, you know, there's another instance where Jesus breed on man. When was that? Anyone remembers? Uh, Pastor, this verse is in John 20, 22. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so John chapter 20 was, to, thank you, uh, John. So John chapter 20 was um, 22 says, um, uh, 21, again, Jesus said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, and if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Okay, so here this is Jesus appearing to his disciples after he um, he died and rose again. And he breathed on them and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So when is another instance in the Bible when we see Jesus breathe on mankind? During creation. Thank you. Uh, during creation, when he breathed, he made Adam, but when Adam was not, uh, was not a, a living being, but when Jesus breathed his breath, uh, you know, uh, he, um, he received a life. So here, uh, it's talking when Jesus breathed on them, it's basically Jesus imparting something about himself, imparting his life into uh, the life of his uh, disciples, that is their born again experience. Uh, they could only be born again after he died for their sins and he rose again. And so here, uh, when he's talking about, he breathed on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. It is what happens when we are born again. We receive the life of God. So when he breathes, uh, the, he's basically breathing his breath. So it's their salvation experience the newness of life their born again experience and uh, we also read in john chapter 14 and 16 jesus says the holy spirit will come and dwell with you for ever so when we are born again the holy spirit comes and dwells in, in us for Ever. But we read, uh, like we read in uh, Luke chapter 24, uh, verse 49, and also in other places, and um, in Acts chapter uh, 1, verse 8, um, and also we read um, uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he, uh, you know, Jesus says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. Uh, verse 5 it says, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized uh, with the Holy Spirit. And then verse 8, like I already uh, mentioned, verse 8. So uh, what is this? Again, you know, you will receive the Holy Spirit. Why should they receive the Holy Spirit a second time? Uh, when they've already received the Holy Spirit, when we read in John chapter 20, verse 20, Jesus prayed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. So that is their born again experience. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, um, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And when they receive power that he's talking about here uh, in, in uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, in Luke chapter 20, verse 49, he's talking about them being clothed with power that is the in filling power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus clearly mentions that you know when you receive this power it's basically power to help you be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth or to the ends of the earth okay so this new power is the intensified power for proclaiming the gospel for working of miracles and uh, to triumph or overcome or be victorious over the enemy uh, that was given to the disciples after christ resurrected from the uh, 
resurrection dead and was part of the new resurrection power that characterized the Christian life. So we see that after, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Christ, like Lubega said, all of them had gone into hiding. Um, but when Christ resurrected and he came and he met them uh, and he was there with them, 40 days, he spoke about various aspects of the kingdom of God and also talked about the promised gift of the of the Father, the coming of the Holy Spirit when they'll be endured with power. And we see that after the day of Pentecost, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, that they went out with great power and, um, you know, that uh, they not only preached, but their preaching was attested with mighty signs, miracles, um, and wonders. And we see that uh, they did greater things than even what uh, Jesus had done. So this is the power that we receive, the resurrection power uh, of Christ, um, which brings us newness of life which includes power for ministry and for the work of the kingdom and uh, for doing mighty signs, miracles and wonders and also being victorious over every power of the enemy. Okay. Uh, another uh, benefit of um, Christ's resurrection or the doctrinal significance of the resurrection, the first one we saw as Christ's resurrection en ensures our regeneration. Uh, Christ's resurrection also ensures our uh, justification. We had uh, just studied about justification in Doctrinal Foundation on uh, on Friday. Uh, the only passage that um, does talk about uh, Christ's resurrection that uh, uh, ensures our justification is um, and it's connected with Christ's resurrection uh, is uh, in Romans chapter four, verse twenty-five. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, Paul uh, connects uh, justification, our justification with Christ's uh, res resurrection. So our receiving, um, uh, you know, of Christ or what he has done and him being resurrected from the dead is a declaration that we are not guilty but righteous before God. So Paul says that... Uh, you know, in um, Romans chapter 4, verse 25, uh, that Christ was put to death for our trespasses and raised for our justification. We read this uh, verse on Friday. Uh, Paul writes there, he says, Christ was put to death for our trespasses, but he was raised for our um, justification. So when Christ was raised from the dead, uh, it was not a declaration of approval of Christ's work of redemption uh, because Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross, as we read uh, where Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And uh, in verse 9, uh, we also read that God highly exalted him. So by raising Christ from the dead, God the Father uh, was basically saying that he approved of Christ's work of suffering, uh, of him dying for our sins, and that his work was completed, and that Christ no longer had any need to remain dead. Uh, there's no penalty for sin that is left anymore, no more wrath of God uh, to bear, uh, no more guilt, uh, no liability to punishment, all has been completely paid for and there is no guilt that remains. So in the resurrection, uh, God is basically saying uh, to Christ that I approve of what you have done and uh, that he has, that Jesus has found favor in his sight. So this actually explains to us how Paul can say that uh, you know, when he writes that Christ was raised for our justification, uh, if God has raised Christ with him, uh, as we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, then uh, because of our union with Christ, because we have accepted Christ, because we believe in Christ, we become one in Christ, uh, God also declares or approves of Christ's, um, uh, 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 you know, Christ's uh, work, in our lives, he approves it, declares it as a done thing, a completed thing. Um, so Christ, when God declares Christ's work as completed, as done, it's also his declaration of approval of us that we are complete. Now we stand redeemed or we stand justified. 
means um, we are completely forgiven, uh, you know, and we are seen as people just as if we have never sinned. Okay. So when fa the father said to Christ um, that all penalty for sins has been paid and um, that, um, you know, he finds him not guilty but righteous in his sight, uh, you know, God the Father is making a declaration that would also apply to us uh, when once we trust Christ uh, and we trust uh, or uh, we believe or we declare uh, we believe in our hearts and declare in our mouths what Christ has done. Uh, we trusted Christ in our salvation. Uh, you know, we are also declared uh, righteous in God's sight. We are declared uh, not guilty in His sight because what Christ has done. He has paid the penalty for our sins. And just as God the Father declares Jesus Christ's work as completed, as done, uh, him as righteous and no longer guilty in his sight and reinstated back to his position as God. Uh, we, uh, the, God the Father also makes the same declaration uh, about us or it also applies to us, uh, applies to those of us who have trusted uh, in Christ and put our faith in him and accepted him as our personal savior. So in this way, uh, Christ's resurrection uh, also gave the final proof that uh, he has earned our justification. So when Christ was raised up back to life, uh, the work was completed. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, proof that uh, he has uh, redeemed mankind, paid the penalty, and um, also that we have earned our justification. That means we stand before God uh, as if we have never sinned. And that's because of the righteousness of God that is imputed on us because God the Father declared Jesus Christ is righteous once the work was completed, once he resurrected him back from death to life. Uh, the third uh, area about uh, we can see about the doctrine of resurrection is that Christ's resurrection ensures that we will receive perfect resurrected bodies as well. Okay, so in the New Testament, uh, uh, several times uh, it connects Jesus' resurrection with our final bodily resurrection uh, like we read in first corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 that it says and god raised the lord and will also raise us up by his power uh second corinthians chapter 4 verse 14 can one of you read that please second corinthians chapter 4 verse 14 Second Corinthians chapter four, verse fourteen. Can one of you read that, please? Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise you up with Jesus, and will present us with you. Thank you. So yes, says he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us along also with Jesus and bring us with you into His presence. So you know, we have this assurance that even though we die. Uh, physically one day that we will be raised up uh, and that we will be ushered into his uh, glorious presence where we will live eternally okay um, uh, but we see that you know if you want to know further about uh, the resurrection of our bodies Paul discusses that in length uh, extensively in first Corinthians chapter 15 um, and as we read that Paul says you know that Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Um, and uh, by saying that Christ is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep, is basically using, Paul is using a metaphor here from agriculture, uh, which indicates that we will be like Christ, just like the first fruit um, or the first taste of the ripening crop shows what are the, uh, the other crops or the other harvest that that we are going to receive or the rest of the harvest will be just like the first crop okay so as christ is the first fruits it shows uh, that what our resurrected bodies will be like uh, when god uh, finally uh, comes back uh, the final harvest takes place so to say and he raises us from the dead and brings us into his presence okay so after christ's resurrection 
we know that uh, um, you know the disciples were able to feel Thomas and the other disciples were able to feel uh, you know the nail prints on his hand and his feet the mark of the spear uh, in his side uh, we read this about this in John chapter 20 verse 27 um, so sometimes people uh, wonder if we will also in our new spiritual bodies or in our new glorified bodies, will we uh, also bear uh, the scars of serious injuries that we have received in this life? Will it also remain in our resurrected bodies? Um, that's not true, um, you know, because uh, we will be raised um, glorious bodies that are imperishable uh, that is without any scar, without any pain, uh, with no weaknesses, with no sickness. Um, but, uh, you know, Christ just bearing the wounds that he received in his life, was able to show it in his body to the disciples to just prove to them he is not a ghost, uh, but he is, um, uh, he has resurrected from the dead. It's just, uh, uh, you know, an uh, eternal reminder of his sufferings and his death. Um, for us um, and the fact that he chooses to retain those scars does not necessarily mean that we too will you know retain our uh, emotional scars or uh, you know pain or brokenness in our spiritual bodies rather we will be healed and we will all be made perfect and whole okay uh, there's a fifth point that we will look at, the eternal significance of uh, Christ's resurrection. Uh, we just have one more minute, so I will stop here. Any of you have any questions, doubts to what was said so far? I hope all of you were following through. Was it okay? Uh, just made a mention of the Holy Spirit because there was a question asked by, uh, I think it was Paul. I hope uh, there was clarity on that, Paul. About the gift of the Holy Spirit, empowering of the Holy Spirit. Are you all able to hear me? You are in class? Okay, I hope uh, today's class uh, helped. Um, we'll end class if there are no comments. Yes, Abu Bakr, we've already finished, uh, ended our time, but you can still raise your question. I can uh, answer you on the stream page or uh, maybe answer it in the next class. Go ahead. It's not, it's not a question, ma. I just want a clarification. Okay about the uh, assignment and uh, the status of my assignment is missing and i submitted the assignment i want to i want to know me i, I, want, I want to know maybe my assignment was submitted or not yes i've received your assignment is, uh, under the status okay thank you ma. yes um uh, i have received your assignments i'll um, correct your assignments i've just been doing the the ones on the e-learning i also teach uh, other three courses so this i'll uh, just finish those on the e-learning and then uh, get to those in the google classroom okay okay no questions no comments then uh, we'll continue on this uh, in the next class and then when we'll move on to the next two chapters there's very very little known in the two chapters. Uh, we'll see what we can best do to um, you know, to elaborate the points and make it, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that you can understand and have in that studies on that. Okay, thank you so much for joining class. Have a good day and I'll see you for our next class. Okay, bye everyone. Bye ma'am. Ma'am, if you can please help me with my mail.